Hello lovely people and welcome back to Queer History 101. Now, for those of you who are new here or might have maybe missed a few videos, hi, hello, hit subscribe. Did you know my analytics tell me when you're watching without subscribing? <gasps> I know. I'm Jessica and in this series I unpick LGBTQ plus history across the ages to share with you some bits you might not have heard of or discovered. It's all about making history just that little bit more colourful. Today I'm going to be talking about the Victorian concept of the lesbian third gender huh? and the history of how gender and sexuality were discussed and classified in the 20th century. Why are we looking at the Victorians specifically then? Well, other than having a vast and glorious selection of top-hatted women, which... Fabulous. This period in time, beginning from the early to mid 1800s and lasting into the early 1900s, has been described as pivotal in its contribution to modern language and attitudes around sexuality and gender norms for Western based cultures and the cultures that they just decided to stamp their own culture onto, obviously. Essentially, it was a time where there were very strict rules for women don't wear your hair down, don't ride a bike, and definitely don't wear trousers. Oh, and just the thought of an ankle. <gasps> but it was also a surprising period in history, full of experimentation, rebellion, and bending of gender expression across the spectrum of society, no matter how you identified. Interestingly, the notion of a third category for gender has been around for a long time. Within Victorian society, many rules of behavior tied together gender performance and status with strict codes covering what was socially acceptable and what wasn't. It wasn't that these were necessarily lists of rules literally written on a wall. Try to think of it more as a, a no shirt, no service sign. You don't need to say it unless you're one of the places that really needs to say it. This of course included how women styled their hair being of the utmost importance. If you were below the marrying age, then it was perfectly acceptable to wear it down. And they actually styled it pretty much the same way for boys and girls. Good luck working out which one is the prince in this painting. But once girls from good families had reached a certain age, their hair was pulled up and certainly would not be down in public or else they might be mistaken for a sex worker. Or you know, just a working class woman who did not have the time to stick 5,000 pins into her head today. Oosh, I'd love to see them read a copy of Vogue. I mean, I think they'd have heart palpitations. In fact, the Victorians were so obsessed with social status that as long as you kept up appearances in the streets, whatever you did in the sheets, I mean, unless someone reported you, which I'll talk about a bit later, was your own business. In their eyes, gender was more important than sexuality and not adhering to social norms was enough to ungender you and place you in this third category, which they called inverted, making someone an invert. If you were an invert, you didn't belong to either gender and thus were an outcast from society. And yes, I imagine you can see the echoes with the old-fashioned homophobic argument that same-sex attraction is just inverted narcissism, which is bizarre, because no. But here's a list of things that can place you in the invert category. Riding a bike as a woman. Having short hair as a woman. Studying in a man's field as a woman, like finance, law or business. And going to university as, you guessed it, a woman. It was thought that such acts, if women were allowed to pursue them, would arrest the development of their reproductive system and then just render them incapable of birthing and raising a family. Again, another excellent and accurate observation of the time. And cross-dressing, especially for men, who were not only ungendered but given the nickname fairy. Interestingly, in the early Victorian period before the rise of psychological and sexual studies, effeminate men who were attracted to other effeminate men were thought of as masculine, as they were still technically attracted to the stereotypical female aesthetics and tropes in their love interest of choice, albeit male. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. If you find yourself resonating with some of what we talked about today and feel you need someone to talk to, then maybe BetterHelp is just what you're looking for. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed therapist. With their network of over 20,000 professionals, including not only professionals who identify as LGBTQ plus themselves, but also who specialize in those areas. You can start communicating with your therapist in as little as 48 hours, which is perfect. If you have a family like me, then you will understand time is very precious when you have a baby, I've got to say. When I'm looking for therapy, I really need it to work to my schedule. 
BetterHelp's main priority is to make sure you feel as comfortable as possible. You can adjust timings and even your therapist. You can switch between them so quickly. You don't even need to tell the therapist. There's no face to face. There's, there's no like, oh, I'm letting you go now. Um, I found some other therapist that I'm going to talk to. You don't have to worry about it. BetterHelp handles it. It's okay. If you find that sitting in a traditional waiting room for your therapist just isn't your thing, there are a number of different ways that you can talk to a better health therapist. Yes, you can video call, but you can also phone call, you can instant message, you can leave journal entries. There are so many different ways that you can get in contact with each other. There's going to be something that works for you. If you're interested in trying BetterHelp, I have a special offer for my followers. 10% off your first month when you sign up using the link in the description. Because please, don't be like the Victorians and hide your feelings. When you need help, accept it and grow. Be the best you you can be. Like all periods of history, however, people did not adhere to a strict binary. The gender spectrum, existing since always. Chevalier Deon, a French spy and diplomat who was born in 1728, had a very fluid gender expression. They spent nearly half of their life presenting in masculine clothing and identifying as male. But the Chevalier in their older years appeared in Queen Elizabeth's court dressed in feminine clothes, requesting recognition from the French government in their identity as a woman. Transgender people struggled to be recognised and respected in a world where gender was fully black and white partially because it wasn't understood and partially because it was seen as an act rather than an identity. Now, interestingly, in the Americas, the cultures of indigenous people at that time were incredibly diverse. In fact, tribes across the country had complex languages to include multiple genders and sexualities. Whilst each tribe is different, a common phrase has emerged in modern times to denote some Native Americans who feel they have multiple genders inside of them and fulfill a third gender or gender variant ceremonial and societal role in their cultures. And that phrase is two-spirit. Of note though, that is an umbrella English language term that can serve as a unifier and be helpful to a general audience, sort of specifically in distinguishing between native and non-native LGBTQ plus people and the kind of culturally specific roles that people fulfill. One very famous two-spirit was an Apache known as Lozen, who was born in 1840 and described by her brother to be as strong as a man, braver than most and cunning in strategy. Lozen is a shield to her people. Lozen actually acted as a mediator between the US Army and Geronimo's band until she was sadly imprisoned and died of tuberculosis. Another famous chief spirit was Wiwa of the Zuni, who was born in 1849. Wiwa was an ambassador for her people and highly respected by her community. Two-spirited people held prominent positions within their tribes, but sadly maintaining their traditions was very difficult during the 1800s and 1900s due to colonialization and the opposing views on gender that were imposed by Victorian society. Many two-spirit people were tragically forced to adhere by missionaries, boarding schools, and the US government. Back in England, expectations around intimate and marital relationships had become very strict, putting pressure on Victorian LGBTQ plus folks. This is when we saw a lot of social fronts being put on, including things such as lavender marriages, where a gay man and a gay woman present publicly in a heterosexual manner, but be free to explore their own identities behind closed doors. Hidden signals within clothing, such as green and red neckties amongst the queer community of New York, to indicate sexuality and many more. And this is just scratching the surface. Did you know that a green carnation became a queer symbol in 1892 when Oscar Wilde encouraged a few of his friends to wear them on the opening night of his comedy, Lady Windermere's Fam, and from there on, wearing one was a hint that you liked other men. Also during this time period, we started to see an uprising of the anti-suffrage movement, a counter-movement opposing a widespread group of women who were working hard to have their voices heard and ultimately allowed the right to politically vote. This movement was not just comprised of men, but also of women, who believed that they themselves should not be allowed an opinion in what was ultimately a political realm devised and run by heterosexual cisgender men for heterosexual cisgender men. At this time, around the late 1800s, self-proclaimed sexologists Richard von Kraft Ebbing and Havelock Ellis were also working away on their own research and announced to the world that they had pioneered the so-called scientific study of sexuality, creating categories for homosexuality and heterosexuality. So unfortunately, these categories were entirely socially constructed concepts where folks were kind of deemed to be 
be the normal or perverse and is um, entirely unhelpful and damaging announcement that has ultimately paved the way for many people to be justified in their homophobic attitudes in the decades that have followed. So nice work, gentlemen. Thanks for that. Brilliant. It is important to note, however, that this classification which started in the Victorian era is incredibly pivotal in gender and sexuality studies globally. Labels can be a bad thing if they're applied to us by other people. But labels can also be a really good thing if there's something that we are owning, we are choosing, and we're deciding, hey, yeah, that's me. Prior to the development of these concepts, we'll call them concepts, there's no more to it than that. If you enjoyed the company of the same sex, didn't play into your assigned gender role, or were a woman and just goddamn wanted to wear your top hat, poodle down to the shops on your bike, then such a thing may have been viewed more as actions and behaviours. However, after these studies, these actions became identities that were subject to the judgement of wider society. So to put it simply, cross-dressing or having intimate relations with the same sex used to be a thing you did rather than what you were. And obviously, there are pros and cons to identity. And it's important to note here that one of the things that this perhaps accidentally did help our community with is that your LGBTQ plus identity is about you. One of the things I really hated when I was younger was being questioned with, but how can you know you're gay if you've not kissed a girl? And I was like, well, I've not kissed a boy either, so why do you think I'm straight? because your sexuality doesn't necessarily have to be about you in relation to other people. It can just be about you, because in fact, it is. It's you as a human being. It's not how other people perceive you. Unfortunately though, the development of psychology and sexology as fields of study lent critical voices a highly pathologised foundation upon which to build their arguments. The anti-suffrage movement, whether by intention or not, integrated the frameworks of homosexuality and gender expression established by these fields of study into their media and public statements. The result was a campaign which effectively attacked not only the women's movement, but all forms of gender variance. Further, the notion of androgyny put forth by the movement reflected a misogynistic hostility towards any form of gender-bending expression. Oh, you want to vote? You must hate your husband and children. In the Victorian era, lesbian and bisexual acts by women were not uncommon, and they were never actually made illegal, unlike their male counterparts whose homosexual acts, even those done in private, were strictly criminalised against by the introduction of something called the Labouchere Amendment. The Labouchere Amendment came about after a series of events in Los Angeles during the 1890s called All Fools Night, where men and women could attend an evening in lavish outfits, masquerading as opposite genders, expressing their creative sides, dancing, drinking and partying. Think of, you know, think Victorian pride, but instead of people eating a doner kebab outside of a nightclub at 3am, they had ball gowns and a peacock platter. So a group of people really didn't like this and accosted the LA City Council to draw up something called Ordinance 5022, which made it illegal for men to masquerade as women and women to masquerade as men. This was in place all across the West until the mid 20th century. It meant that anyone convicted of sodomy or bakery, as they were called, were subjected to years of imprisonment with hard labor and spirit breaking abuse or they could be sentenced to death. One of the most high profile victims of the Labouchere Amendment was the famous playwright, author, and aesthetics lecturer, Oscar Wilde. In 1891, after keeping his sexual identity a secret, Wilde entered into a relationship with Lord Alfred Douglas, the son of the Marcus of Queensbury. The Marcus aggressively harassed Wilde until she accused him of the illegal act of sodomy, where he was sentenced to two years in prison. He was never the same when he returned, and his creative spark had completely burnt out, leading to his early death only three years after his release. So why weren't lesbians included in this then? Well, it's said that the authors of the amendment may have excluded lesbianism for fear of alerting more women in society 
to the possibility, thus rendering an influx of top-hatted lesbians coming out of the closet and sending the finger of God through the straight women in Victorian England that they would be turned to a life of Birkenstocks, dogs and shopping for houseplants. <sighs> Sounds dreamy to me. Claudia just bugs and Birkenstocks, I know. There's also a rumour that lesbians weren't included because Queen Victoria just didn't believe in them. Peak Queen Victoria. And thus they found that the best way to deal with the lesbian problem was just to consider them an other. Desexed, if you will. Not quite women, but not men. Just sort of there. And whilst it's never great to be ignored, at least these lesbians who were just considered the third gender weren't suffering like many, many of their male counterparts. Many roots of homophobia can be traced back to this time period, stemming from the fear of the unknown and non-conformist attitudes of those who we now know were part of the LGBTQ plus community. As time progressed, these Victorian laws and amendments have transformed into the modern day legislation that we are aware of across the globe. The Labouchere Amendment and following legislation that criminalized same-sex relationships between men was finally scrapped in 1967 in the United Kingdom allowing freedom for the LGBTQ plus community to finally have their voices heard. For me, Pride Month is about more than just celebrating where we're at right now, but also looking back to the past to see what we can learn from in terms of how much further we have to go in the many places around the world where acceptance is not where it needs to be. Studying LGBTQ plus history is an important tool to help those of us with greater freedoms appreciate them and also not take them for granted. I'm aware I personally live in a very accepting bubble. I'm able to marry the woman I love. We have a gorgeous baby together. We're not even the only same-sex parents at his nursery. And we're certainly not the only parents in our LGBT cross friend group, but we also live in a very accepting city. And even though our country as a whole is very progressive, we do factor in that when we eventually live our dreams of moving to the countryside, it will just be to the outskirts of this same very accepting city because because we feel comfortable here. Pride Month is for the whole community. Whether you're out to everyone, whether you've told no one, even if you're still questioning your feelings yourself. So happy Pride Month to you! If you've enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more queer history content from me, then firstly, subscribe. And secondly, click the card in the top left-hand corner of the screen and let's have some fun together. Thank you so much for watching. Please let me know in the comments if you knew about the history of Victorian lesbians already, or if you learned something new today. Thank you again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Remember, you get 10% off your first month when you sign up using the link in the description, and you help to keep the channel going. It's betterhelp.com slash Jessica. That's better, H-E-L-P, all one word. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.